Hello everyone, this is Professor Dr. Burja Katakurch from Micronanotechnology Program and I'm also the director of Central Laboratory. Um, I'll be uploading my class notes uh, on Tuesdays for the first three weeks while Bilge Hoca is uploading hers, uh, which will be held on Fridays. I'm also the coordinator of this class, so if you have any questions, you can contact me from my email address. So we're going to make an introductory class today and talk about how to make uh, nanomaterials. Uh, imagine you, you want to make the tiniest computer chip possible and let's say your, uh, this is your computer chip, okay? This is your bulk nanostructured solid that you want to make uh, for the company that you're working at, for example. In general, in nanotechnology, you have two approaches, okay? The first one is the top-down approach and the second one is the bottom-up approach. So using the bottom-up approach, uh, you want to assemble this uh, bulk non-structured solid uh, or your chip atom by atom, placing each type of atom at a specific location, okay? So you control what you're doing here when you are following the bottom-up approach atom by atom, just like you're building a big Lego brick uh, building, for example. And on the contrary, the top-down approach, uh, you create this chip uh, like an artist who is carving uh, the sculpture, for example. So you take a bigger material and you basically carve it to produce what you want to make. So bottom-up approach is basically building your material like a Lego part brick by brick, okay? And that's what uh, this says here, the top-down, intermediate, and bottom-up approaches to making bulk nanostructured solids, okay? So these are the two uh, terminologies that you need to be familiar with in terms of the scale that we are working with, okay? So today I'm going to just give you uh, some examples on the top-down approach, okay? Uh, there are several very simple examples that we can uh, discuss. The first one is called the rapid solidification. But in general, in top-down approach, uh, you take your material and drug, beat and freeze it. Drug it by alloying beat it by severe plastic deformation, freeze it to stop the fine scale structure once formed from coarsening, okay? And rapid solidification, the first step is to mix in elements with different sized atoms, each preferring a different atomic spacing and crystal structure, making crystallization difficult. So uh, literally you fill your metal things into this reservoir and let's say heat it to produce a molten alloy, okay? And then the second step is to cool quickly, leaving little or no time for crystallization, okay? And uh, once, and there is a rotating drum here that forms your uh, material at the end. This is like a, uh, like a ribbon, for example, limiting the form to thin wires and ribbons from which heat can be conducted quickly. So a jet of liquid alloy, one designed to be hard to crystallize, is squirted onto a spinning water-cooled copper drum. The process is called matte spinning, okay? This is called matte spinning. So what are we doing here? We're taking a big uh, chunk particles, uh, using heat we form a molten alloy, and then we cool it quickly to form a mixture, a nano mixture of our mixed particles, taking the top-down approach. Okay. Another example can be given as a ball milling, for example. This is a very highly used uh, approach, uh, 
in a, another term is milling and mechanical alloying. It's a very simple approach to, again, uh, grasp the concept of. Uh, you have these uh, balls. Uh, milling combines extreme deformation with the forcible alloying of two materials that normally that normally would not mix. Okay, so particles here, two metals A and B, are spun in a high energy ball mill. They have a steel or carbide balls are thrown against each other. These are my carbide balls. Okay, they go and hit each other forming uh, these uh, little nanoparticles in between components A's and B's that normally don't mix. They become so small and mix to each other. So basically you crush it. Uh, the process creates heavily deformed mechanically alloyed particles with, if continued long enough, a nanoscale internal structure, okay? So I'm going to try to show you an example for uh, Mat spinning. Let's hear it all together from here. Mel has also indigenously developed a melt spinning system of one kilogram capacity. The master alloy is prepared by arc melting pure elements and then casting into ingot comprising of ferromagnetic elements, metalloids, and other alloying elements. The master alloy ingot is taken in quartz crucible. A thermocouple is fitted in the quartz crucible to monitor the melt temperature. Then crucible is placed inside the inductions coils above the rotating wheel. Eject gas pressure port is connected for ejection of the melt. In the melt spinning process, ribbon thickness is controlled by the rotating wheel speed, ejection pressure, nozzle slot size and the gap between nozzle and wheel surface. During melt spinning, the rotation of quenching wheel is set at a desired velocity and ingot is melt by induction heating. The liquid melt is ejected through the orifice at the bottom of the crucible using argon gas pressure. The melt which rapidly quenched is thrown off at the periphery of rotating wheel and gets collected through the exit duct in the form of ribbon. By optimizing the planner flow casting process parameters continuous ribbons of amorphous electrical steel with width of around 25 mm and thickness of 25 to 50 microns were prepared. At CSIR NML, wide range of amorphous N and nanostructured alloys for multiple applications were prepared. The amorphous electrical steels can be used to make C cores for transformers while silicon steels are used as E-type transformer cores. Efforts have also been made to prepare nanostructured materials with ultra-soft magnetic properties having low coercivity with high susceptibility. Laboratory has successfully developed high induction iron cobalt based alloys called Hindmet, having Curie temperature greater than 1000 Kelvin and saturation induction of 1.75 Tesla, which are applicable in high frequency power transformers and space power systems. Okay, so let's continue. This was just to give you an example, a real example of what's going on in a lab who's actually using these top-down approaches. Okay, um, among the top-down approach processes, uh, the most famous one is what's so-called the nanoprofiling or nanolithography. Uh, there's already a process called lithography uh, and we're going to focus on the nano lithography. This course and its details are going to be taught in more detail by Kwan Choja towards the end of our semester. But I'm just going to summarize the general concepts of what's going on in here. Okay, so often it's not a nano material, but it is the nano features on the surface of something much bigger, okay? So uh, usually we don't, uh, we're not always trying to make the nano material, but what's important can be the nano features that we create on the surfaces of something much bigger, okay, in nanotechnology. These are created by micro machining, which is cutting material away, or micro lithography, which is putting material where you want to put it, okay? So the most famous ones are, for example, the electron beam machining, EBM, or focused ion beam machining, FIB, okay? These are the 
some of the micro machining methods that can be used for nano profiling. And when we're talking about nanolithography, there's something called nanolithography. It's a process used to manufacture computer chips and it's able to produce features smaller than 100 nanometer. Okay, so this is usually it's used to make printed circuit boards or integrated circuits uh, and so on. Okay, so the first thing that we do is an oxidized silicon wafer is coated by a photoresist layer. But before all of that, the silicon must first be carefully cleaned and free of dust or trace contaminants, okay? And then we treat the silicon wafer by the photoresist. So in order for this process to be as clean as possible, usually photolithography and all lithographic actions are happening in clean rooms, okay? And then a beam of UV light is incident on a mask, allowing light to pass through the gaps. Uh, okay. The light is then passed through a set of lenses to reduce the pattern size, which is projected onto the wafer, causing a photochemical reaction where it strikes the resist. And the exposed parts of the resist are dissolved during the developing stage. The assembly is then placed in an acidic solution, which attacks the silica, but not the resist or the silicon. And once the silica has been removed, the resist is dissolved in a different acidic solution, okay? And further, etches remove silicon from the exposed areas, creating channels. The resulting nano-featured chip, and I want to underline the nano-featured part, may then be processed further to make it electronically active or be used as a template for soft lithography. Okay, so these lithographic tools are also top-down approaches. Um, uh, the feature size, let's go back to photolithography, the important part here is the feature size is limited by the wavelength of the light that you use, okay? So the wavelength of my light here is important. So uh, e-beam lithography, on the contrary, it's using, well, UV light is a wavelength of 250 nanometers, giving a limiting feature size by the diffraction effects. Greater resolution is possible with e-beam lithography. In e-beam lithography, the pattern is written in a polymer film with a beam of electrons. The shorter wavelength of the electrons allows features with a smaller scale than is possible with UV light, but the technique is slow, and expensive. Okay, every technique in nanotechnology uh, uh, have their own advantages and disadvantages. You always have to look at your optimization uh, rules, okay, or optimization options. So here is, uh, this is what is going on. The collimated UV beam hits your mask and then you create your features and then you clean it with the assist uh, with the acidic solutions, you get rid of your resists, and at the end, you obtain your nano featured surface by these lithographic techniques. The third uh, very well known approach is called the soft lithography. This is also very highly used because of its simplicity. The most recent lithography methods make use of mechanical processes like printing, stamping, molding, okay, instead of photons on photons and or electrons. Uh, so in soft lithography, you literally, you use your, uh, your thing like a stamp. You stamp your um, feature onto your surface and it's very short and cheap and easy to make. The starting point uh, is again a silicon mold made by photolithography or e-beam lithography, which can be used over and over again sometimes. The advantage of using soft lithography method is that once the master template has been made, you don't need any other special equipment. Okay, so again, in this figure, you can see the steps that uh, you have to go through for the soft lithography technique. Like I said, these uh, lithographic tools uh, will be taught by Kwan Choja later on during our course. 
And I would like to end this class by showing you some of the real uh, research examples that I had made in my lab with my students. These are little zeolite uh, nanoparticles that we produce in the lab. And once you uh, synthesize these materials, uh, like this one is like a zeolite, a zeolite crystal, okay, you obtain uh, several hundred grams of zeolite, for example, that which you can just put in a bag and store. So what was in, important for us was to make like biosensors or some other sensors, like humidity sensors, whatever, uh, for some advanced applications. And for that purpose, we needed to assemble these zeolite particles onto uh, an electrode uh, uh, that will form a monolayer, which was difficult to achieve. Not only we did that, as you can see, these zeolite uh, particles here uh, have come together as a monolayer, okay? But also we formed uh, some patterns using the E-beam lithography technique. And this is my scale here, 20 microns, okay? So this is a pretty small uh, pattern that was put onto a silicon wafer. It was actually really hard to see on an SCM for characterization. Uh, so, uh, then we change our technique and we use the uh, U, uh, the photolithography. Okay, uh, once we start to use the photolithography, we couldn't make as small patterns as we had obtained using the e beam lithography, but it was much shorter, it was much less expensive. Our features were uh, in size, they were larger, but they were efficient enough to absorb protein and biological molecules onto our uh, pattern substrates, which were then, uh, afterwards, we made biosensors out of these electrodes, okay? In summary, and these all these information were gathered from the book that I shared with you uh, as a reference. As a summary, uh, we have, there are several different techniques to make nanoparticles, okay? Methods for making nanoparticles, nano clusters, nanolayers. Today we talked about, um, for example, things like beading, or uh, that's the only bottom uh, top-down approach here. We're going to talk about these uh, other techniques. These, these are for gas phase. These are for liquid phase uh, re reactions to make nanoparticles. And they are bottom-up approaches, CVD, PVD. We're going to talk about those in our next class. And these are the top-down approaches that I tried to summarize or give you an idea about here. Melt spinning, powder milling, uh, micro-machining, okay? So these are different approaches that you can take for making nanoparticles that you have to think about if you were to make a decision one day in a company that you're working for, for example. And there are methods for nanoprofiling, e-beam lithography, focus ion beam machining, soft lithography, photolithography. Okay, the only thing that we haven't talked about today is the bottom-up approach, which we will discuss in our next class. And this, again, you can find in your book, it's very important for you guys to have an idea about the scales, the nanoscale, microscale, macro scale, and then the forms of your particles, like bulk forms, films, wires, one-dimensional particles, zero-dimensional films, two-dimensional, and then the processes that is being used to make these different types of nanoparticles, nanofilms, nanowires, and so on, okay? This is a summary of what we're trying to achieve as nanotechnology people here.